Greetings and welcome to the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education's webinar titled Beyond Performative Activism, Strategies for Dismantling Anti-Blackness and Promoting Anti-Racism on Campus. We recognize the historical and ongoing impacts of settler colonialism. And we make this statement as an acknowledgement that decolonization cannot happen until the ancestral lands are returned to communities harmed by colonialism. True decolonization requires efforts to undo colonization with protests, activism, civil disobedience, education, and legal action. It requires recovery and rejuvenation of pre-colonial heritage, language, traditions, with a focus on health and healing. I'd like to begin this afternoon by acknowledging the sacred indigenous lands of the Piscataway community where the University of Maryland is located today. The Gabriel Lingba Tongba people of Loyola Marymount, where Lo Loyola Marymount is located, excuse me, and the homelands of the Yakima, Menominee, Apache, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Pomo, Ho-Chuck, Sac and Fox Nations and Klamath people where, the where Pennsylvania State University is located. We give honor and pay respect to the lands where the knowledge and labor that informs this scholarship took place. We also acknowledge and bear witness to the enslaved labor and stolen identities of African diaspora ancestors who sacrificed their bodies and blood across these lands. Their labor and living shall not be in vain. Let's all take a moment for reflection as we acknowledge the land and labor. Thank you. My name is Dr. Candace M. Moore, and I serve as the Associate Clinical Professor in the College of Education, as well as the Founding Director of the Center for Diversity and Inclusion in Higher Education. We are very pleased to bring to you this exceptional panel of higher education leaders and experts to be a part of the Center's third webinar in our series on anti-racism in higher education. We have a few programming notes for our attendees today. This webinar features closed captioning. Each participant may select to show subtitles from their, her, his device. Please remember to place your questions in the Q&A feature. Also, this session is being recorded. A copy of the recording will be available within 48 hours following the webinar via email to webinar registrants. We certainly would like to acknowledge and thank the center's amazing team for helping to facilitate our webinar today. Thank you. We invite you to engage with us during the webinar via Twitter using the hashtag UMDCDIHE. I now like to introduce our moderator for this webinar, Dr. Roger L. Worthington, Professor of Counseling Psychology and Founding Executive Director of the center. Dr. Worthington. Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to our program, Beyond Performative Action Activism Strategies for Dismantling Anti-Blackness and Promoting Anti-Racism on Campus. I'll introduce our panel shortly, but before I do that, I wanna frame our discussion with some introductory comments. Last year, during the resurgence of the racial justice movement and Black Lives Matter. It seemed like people in the United States, indeed across the globe, actually sat up and started really paying attention. Maybe it was the pandemic, maybe because everyone was at home paying close attention to the news, suddenly there were many, many more people who seemed to be paying attention. And as people began to take to the streets, people wondered, whether the ground had shifted under our feet. It's important to acknowledge the many white people who have been engaged in anti-racism efforts for many years. And at the same time, it was clear to so many of us that there were many white people who were just now tuning in. That even if they had already known of the long history of police violence and murder against black bodies, they were suddenly awakened by the horror and reality of it. Suddenly Colin Kaepernick was viewed as a visionary rather than a traitor by some. 
corporate CEOs and college and university presidents began issuing statements. And that is where one form of performative action began to take uh, part in the discourse. My good friend and colleague, Benjamin D. Reese Jr. called out academic leaders in the following way. He said, and I quote, I appreciate the comments from academic leaders across the country, but in my humble opinion, most don't appropriately focus on what I see as the key issues at hand. Almost all of them focus on category two and not on category one. So let's examine both. What, what does he mean uh, in, what does he include in category two, the, the default, if you will? Category two includes the need to treat everyone fairly, advocating for greater respect for difference, seeking greater inclusion, and expressing solidarity with those experiencing pain. Now compare that to category one, which says, which includes focusing on institutional and structural racism, recognizing the failures of leadership in politics, policing, healthcare, business, and higher education to confront structural racism. The need for significant and long-term structural changes in wealth distribution, in health policies, policing, voting, higher education, et cetera. And personal and institutional admission that past efforts, although often well-meaning, have been focused on nuanced changes around the edges while sustaining the current distribution of power and privilege. He concluded by saying, I wanna be clear, category two is important and reflects some of his own personal and pro professional efforts, but it is not enough. Do we as a society and higher education community want peace and programs or racial justice and true reckoning with our past? What he's describing here in part are performative efforts rather than structural and systemic transformational change efforts. If we were in a large auditorium today with our audience of I think uh, we're supposed to be around 300 right now. Um, I'd ask you to raise your hands if you remember Blackout Tuesday. Remember this? What began as an idea to pause business as usual in the music industry on Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020, became an unplanned sea of black boxes on social media that inadvertently silenced the Black Lives Matter movement. And that, in part, began a backlash against performative activism. And you see in this slide, uh, two signs, uh, one that says white silence, is white violence, and another that says your IG post is not enough. But let's take a step beyond higher education and social media and take a critical look at what some consider a performative effort on the part of the federal government that happened just last week. Making Juneteenth a national holiday has been hailed by many, but also criticized by many for stepping over and ignoring significant structural and systemic actions like talking about racism in schools, enacting voting rights legislation, stopping police violence and reparations. Most people never knew about Juneteenth until the racial justice movement began advancing awareness of it in 2020, just last year. Indeed, there's a conservative movement underway to promote a fake culture war battleground over critical race theory. Most 
which most of those declaring a position against it don't even know what it is, much less understand that it isn't even taught in the primary and secondary public schools. The ignorance about critical race theory is far more pervasive than an academic concept. Indeed, it is an expansive ignorance about race and racism in US history, in which half the country is kept blissfully uninformed about the horrors and atrocities that fill our legacy as a nation. Fegan in 2010 described the white racial frame as a broad, persisting, and dominant racial frame that has rationalized racial oppression and inequality in US institutions throughout our history and persists in colleges and universities. The organizational structure of higher education institutions are undergirded in whiteness, having profound implications on the policies that drive campus culture, the decision-making processes of administrators, the resource allocations that inform campus priorities and the social relationships between the people in the campus environment. The white racial frame accounts for the absence of black history or indigenous history or Latinx history or Asian history in American history books and curriculum. So if, for example, I show you these photos to most people in the United States, my guess is that the vast majority will have absolutely no idea who they are. Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Dorothy Johnson Vaughan, James Baldwin. Even this next set, most people might recognize only two or, or even three. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, Huey P. Newton, and Professor Angela Davis. And although athletes are obviously more recognizable, some of the historical figures may still be less so to many people. Jesse Owens, Serena Williams, Simone Biles, Shikari Richardson, Arthur Ashe, and Muhammad Ali. And, you know, similar to athletes, artists, and entertainers. Diane Carroll. Whitney Houston, Prince, Oprah Winfrey, Louis Armstrong, Dr. Maya Angelou. Which brings us full circle and back to the point of our program. Black Lives Matter. Pause for a moment and ask yourselves, how many names can you identify for the people pictured here? Clockwise, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tamir Rice, Atatiana Jefferson, Laquan McDonald, Amadou Diallo, and Sandra Bland. In the past 30 years, how long have we been asking this question? Do you know their names? Does the placement of a black square on your Instagram account help us make their lives matter? Indeed, what does it really mean to matter? How do we go beyond performative efforts to make change real in our institutions? How do we make structural and systemic change become transformational? rather than nuanced changes around the edges while sustaining the current distribution of power and privilege, to quote again from Ben Reese. Anti-Blackness and anti-indigeneity have worldwide implications on our society and particularly in the area of higher education. We define performative activism as engagements of activists that center performance 
Activism that is not deeply rooted in a singular cause or social justice cause, but may be motivated by a number of factors, including alleviating guilt, increasing social or material capital, optics, impression management. This type of activism may hinder or complicate our desired goals or outcomes, undermining the prospect of achieving systemic change. The panelists we have assembled here today will discuss the implications of racism for Black people and strategies for dismantling anti-Blackness, anti promoting anti-racism, and mitigating its negative consequences on campuses. This session serves to address how performative activism maintains anti-Blackness in higher education and what institutions can do to dismantle racist systems in their institutions. Now let me introduce our panelists and ask our first question. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, our first panelists, Maya Miguel Hoskin is a visiting assistant professor and co-director of counseling in the Department of Specialized Programs in Professional Psychology at Loyola Marymount University. Welcome, Dr. Hoskin. Thank you for having me. Royal M. Johnson is an assistant professor of education and African-American studies and research associate of education in the Department of Education Policy Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. Greetings. Greetings, everyone. Look forward to the conversation. Rosina Zamora Liu is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning, Policy and Leadership at the University of Maryland here. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, so I have the three of you here now, and um, I'm literally looking forward to a really great conversation. We've had a chance to meet and have a conversation already in preparation for this, and I'm really excited for what's to come. So let me start with the, uh, a very broad and overarching question for all three of our panelists, and that'll be answered in the order of introduction. Um, and so um, the question is, how would you describe performative activism in the context of your work? And briefly talk about the ways performative activism can interfere in efforts to promote anti-racism on campus. Dr. Hat Hoskin, would you like to begin? Absolutely, sure. Um, I, I think it, it really uh, draws from a lot of what you've already um, said. A year ago or last summer, um, when George Floyd was murdered, we did see kind of this resurgence of care and concern about anti-Blackness in America. And, and consequently, colleges and universities quickly released various commitments uh, toward fighting against racial injustice and anti-Blackness, um, both on their college campuses, their communities, and just overall. And you know, I've, I've since talked to a number of colleagues, you know, committees were created, task force were assembled uh, toward this end. And some of those institutions have maintained, right? They've worked to, um, to address their commitment, to work toward their commitment, and others have been distracted. <laughs> and whether that distraction is a result of, as you said, a lot of other motivating factors such as optics, thinking about enrollment, recruitment, retention, right? Um, the bottom line, um, or just there might've been genuine intention at the time, but because uh, true, uh, a true abolitionist mentality is not at the root of the campus culture, various efforts fell to the wayside. And so this becomes problematic because individuals are able to then exonerate themselves or alleviate themselves from the fight against anti-Blackness and say, wait, I'm one of the good ones. I'm an ally. I did something. I released a statement. I sat on a committee. I, 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 right? But nothing has been done. 
And so an illusion has been created that there's been work toward fighting against anti-Blackness for Black faculty, students, staff, and racial injustice overall, but in truth, nothing's been done. And so you look at five years later and you're saying, well, why are we still having the same issues that we were having when we created these task force or these committees? Well, it's because performative activism came in, right? The savior complex came in to create an illusion that work was being done that never got done. And so that delays progress and then further insulates white supremacy within higher education. Great, thank you, Dr. Hoskin. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Sure, uh, so first thank you to Drs. Worthington and Moore for the opportunity to join uh, this important conversation. As Dr. Worthington mentioned, just for some context, I'm a faculty member in higher ed uh, and African-American studies at Penn State and my work broadly focuses on issues related to ed access, uh, racial equity and student success. And what I, what I like to say is it has a sort of unapologetic focus on racially and ethnically minoritized populations and those who are uh, sort of otherwise marginalized or institutionally marginalized. And over the couple of, last couple of years, I have been uh, increasingly concerned with how we connect racial equity research uh, to institutional policy and practice in ways that really have material consequence uh, and that mitigate uh, the performative activism that we're talking about today. Just as a shameless plug, I have a forthcoming a uh, book with Liliana Garces at UT Austin and Uju Anya with SUNY Press about this very topic. Uh, but to answer the question, I think one way we see performative activism playing out is in the discursive practices of institutional leaders. You know, the current moment, social, political, racial moment, uh, requires that leaders uh, have a command and fluency in engaging in discourse about racial equity, justice, anti-Blackness. These are even terms that we weren't using 10 years ago in the diversity space. And though leaders have um, adopted or adapted the language of racial equity to sort of respond to and mollify concerns from uh, campus constituents about the state of affairs, it's not always reflected in their praxis. So what we get is superficial remedies for what are in fact uh, profound and systemic issues. Um, you know, I think performative activism is also reflected in racial symbolism, and this was just sort of uh, alluded to. I find it interesting, but not at all surprising that critical race theory is uh, at the fore of national conversations and the target of uh, right-wing politicians and groups as uh, CRT offers precisely the analytical tools uh, to make sense of and respond to institutional uh, reactions to racism and anti-Blackness. In short, um, one of the progenitors of CRT, Derek Bell, talks about racial symbolism, uh, referring to these uh, symbolic markers or signs of progress uh, that aim to kind of distract us from root causes uh, in systemic issues. And you know, as was just mentioned, we see these in institutional statements, we see it in the commitments, newfound commitments to remove statutes of people who have ties to the Confederacy, names on buildings, commission reports, surveys for campus climate, task force, some of us are on these task force. And while they're important, they often do little uh, to address the structural forces uh, that shape minoritized students' experiences and outcomes, especially black students. Uh, and then the final point I'll just mention is that performative activism is also reflected in the, uh, the sort of cherry picking of racial equity issues that are deemed worthy of redress. Uh, and you know, my sort of perspective is that these are often issues that are most palatable to white constituents on campus. Uh, so for example, in our commitments to black students, are we also concerned with violence against black trans students and gender nonconforming students and others who are multiply marginalized uh, sort of populations? So we have to be equally outraged about all forms of anti-blackness. And I'll stop here and see if Others uh, want to chime in. Great, thank you for those comments. Dr. Liu. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Worthington. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Moore, for including me in this important conversation. And thank you, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Hoskin. It's an honor to be in your company uh, today. And finally, thank you to everybody who is showing up on this beautiful afternoon. Again, my name is Rosina Zamora Liu, and my pronouns are she, hers. I want to first start with my positionality because I think that it affects 
um, my strengths, but also my oversights in terms of how I talk about this topic. I identify as an Asian American woman and as a non-Black educator of color. I share my positionality again, just to situate myself in this conversation. Um, I also serve in the minority and urban ed specialization as a assistant clinical faculty. And I say that very explicitly because of the contingency that I have as a uh, PTK fact faculty, which is a non-tenure track faculty. So everything I say here, I know is also gauged with, um, in, in similar to what Dr. Johnson's saying, unapologetically, but at, at the same time, I also know that there are things that are connected, the consequences that are connected to what I say. I name positionality and I forefront that because I do think that a lot of the performative activism comes from not understanding who we are in relation to this work and the assumption of expertise that um, right after uh, this summer uh, or last summer, sorry, um, you know, we saw a lot of uh, performance happening such as what Dr. Worthington has just shared. We saw a lot on social media uh, with uh, our white colleagues who um, also confess their white racial privileges um, and then um, name their positionality and then move on from there. That is a performance in, in, in my mind and, and seeps talks about a bigger issue, which is when we're thinking about this work and let's say we're identifying ourselves as anti-racist educators fighting anti-blackness, um, it has to seep beyond this performance, right? This beyond uh, performative activism, wherein we're just checking it off and then saying, now we get to do this work. This line of work requires uh, an immense amount of care and but also uh, discipline and, and scholarship. And it can't be that it anybody who wants to do it should do it. Because when you do it, there are, uh, you have to consider and check your positionality. What are your oversights and what do you bring to it? So one of the things I think about a lot is uh, what do Dr. Richard Milner and other black scholars who have taught us is that positionality requires ongoing reflexivity and critical introspection, which I don't see happening uh, in a lot of the scholarship that's out there in higher academy. Um, so who we might ask, for example, who are we in relation to systemic power as well as systemic racism? And certainly many of our colleagues benefit from systemic racism while others of us do not, or we do in medium ways. Uh, the other question might be, um, who are we in relation, of course, to anti-Blackness? And in what ways have we been complicit in perpetuating it? Uh, in perpetuating it? And finally, the other question is, does our work center Black humanity? Are, or more artic articulated more eloquently and explicitly in his forthcoming book on critical race, uh, English education, one of my colleagues and friend, Dr. Lamar Johnson says, we must love blackness as a precondition to humanity. And so as we move forward and beyond performative activism to fight anti-blackness, let Dr. Lamar Johnson's words serve as a compass to guide us in our efforts. So I'll leave it there, thank you. Excellent, thank you again to all three of our panelists to get us started out with this uh, great conversation. Dr. Johnson, I'm gonna come back to you for the next question and give you a chance to elaborate a little bit on your work and uh, talk a little bit about um, how it intersects with this topic. I'm interested in your work in uh, on the role of institutional leaders in cultivating racially equitable campus environments. Uh, given the propensity of institutional leaders to be engaged primarily on a symbolic level, um, if they are engaged in the work of equity and racist, racial justice at all, how do we, those of us who have substantially more expertise or, or engagement, how, how do we help our institutional leaders uh, understand the potential problems of performative efforts and in some way help them understand the need for deep transformational change, uh, going beyond the symbolic and dismantling structural racism at the foundations 
of our institutions? Thank you for the question. Let me just pause and say, I love that question that does your work center Black humanity? It's a question I want to sit with uh, for a bit and I hope we'll return to it in a moment. Uh, but you know, structural transformation also requires the transformation of people. Inequitable structures and systems don't just appear out of nowhere. People create them and they reinforce them. And so one thing that I think is uh, critically important is for leaders to have opportunities to invest in and cultivate uh, their racial literacy and consciousness. We need leaders who uh, can recognize and read racial moments for what they are and feel efficacious about their ability to be able to bring about redress. And I think this can happen through you know, a lot of the work that I do in the Center for the Study of Higher Education with my colleague, Alicia Dowd and others, uh, is thinking about how do we curate professional learning experiences that provide leaders uh, with opportunities to develop and nurture those uh, competencies in the area of racial equity. You'll be surprised by how many uh, sort of questions that we get about, is it Latinx or is it black or is it African-American? Basic questions that require uh, some sort of working knowledge of the history of race and racial categorization uh, that I think leaders ought to be grappling with. I really like the work of Sullivan Simone's uh, notion of equity mindedness, referring to the sort of cognitive reframe that we have to uh, sort of use to think about, see, and problematize racial disparities in higher education. Uh, and, and specifically, institutional leaders have to accept responsibility for student outcomes and uneven sort of patterns of participation and interpret those disparities as a sign uh, that our policies and practices aren't working for all students uh, versus the sort of deficit-minded perspective that prioritizes changes in students over structures. I, I, I meet with institutional leaders who say, you know, we want our, our students to be more gritty or we want our students to have a growth mindset. Well, I want faculty to have a growth mindset when they encounter a student who comes from a background and experience that looks different from them. Uh, so to, I guess to answer the question more directly, I think we move beyond uh, the symbolic in part by making sure that leaders uh, have more than just superficial understandings of structural racism, anti-Blackness, but they are equipped uh, with the tools necessary and they feel efficacious in their ability to bring about change within their sphere of influence. I want to pause for a second, let others jump in. Dr. Hoskin. You know, I really struggle with this question. Um, I used to have a laundry list of romanticized solutions to answer this question until I sat in on a transformational talk with Dr. Bettina Love, in which I questioned my whole existence. <laughs> And this was recently. <laughs> and um, she made an argument about, you know, why are we worried about white fragility? Why are we worried about what are ways that we can essentially convince um, white faculty, white administrators that this stuff is important beyond a performative um, beyond being performative, right? Beyond it being a performance. That is not our job, right? That is not our work to do. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I also am pulled back to, if not us, then who? Then what happens, right? someone has to do something. And, and we see that unfortunately, some of our colleagues who are near and dear to us, they're not going to be those, those to, do, to, to step out, right? Whether it be fear, whether it be a lack of awareness, right, of their own privilege, of their own biases. And so I, I go back and forth and, 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 I, and I, but I definitely do agree that it should not be placed on the backs of, faculty, staff, students of color from marginalized groups to you know, go run tell that, to be the educators of those from privileged groups. I definitely agree with that. That said, that said, especially when we're talking about faculty and staff, I think what's really important is accountability. 
I don't know that any huge widespread um, solution is going to work here, but in those one-off instances, when we're talking to our colleagues, right, and someone makes um, a, you know, a, a microaggression, right, towards someone else, right, we observe it, or toward one of us, right, ourselves, right, instead of electing the path of least resistance, because sometimes we're tired and we don't feel like addressing it, right? And that's all right, and we don't have to address it all the time. But in those moments, um, holding our colleagues accountable, holding administrators accountable, um, insisting, demanding change, de demanding um, the dismantling of, of, of existing policy that is oppressive and that, um, that maintains white supremacy. Um, and, and so for me, I, I think that that's where it starts in educating um, our colleagues and helping them to understand that they have to move beyond performative activism. And then also to help them understand that anti-Blackness and racism as a whole, it doesn't just hurt Black folks. It doesn't just hurt Latinx folks. It doesn't just hurt Natives. It hurts us all. Right, um, you know, I love this idea of humanity, right, of black humanity, because the black community has been dehumanized in a sense, right. But we all have been dehumanized by racism, white folks included, right. And so helping them to understand, and and and, and also individuals from all privileged groups, helping folks to understand how um, various isms right, discrimination, white supremacy, right, how that dehumanizes us all, right? And so I think that's part of, I hope, I, would, I guess, I hope that that's part of kind of moving the needle forward and helping um, folks understand the importance of moving beyond um, kind of this performative piece. Thank you so much for that. I share so much of what you've uh, said. Dr. Hoskin, in terms of that struggle that we have, um, it, ha, who, who does this work? Because when we're talking about it uh, and saying, well, um, let white people just take care of white people, right? Um, in, in some ways, it derails the conversation and it goes back to an impossibility, which is the reconstruction of whiteness. If we live under this current system of white supremacy and systemic racism, you can't reconstruct whiteness. Now, I know there are scholarships out there that talks about that reconstruction, but that's an impossibility because systemic racism implies that you, as a white person, you have white privilege, whether you want it or not. Because And white privilege is not just the benefit of whiteness, but it is the protection from consequences. So you can literally say I don't want to have anything to do with this and you're still not in the same position as a person of color, for example. And so that conversation um, is an important one, but I hear what you're saying because it requires the, the labor of uh, many of us who can or are willing to still do it. But then sometimes I, I know there are days I can't, I, I just can't do it anymore and I can get sick from it. I think the word activism too, when we're thinking about our white colleagues, is that what we call performative activism here in, on this panel, for many of our colleagues, they don't know that it's performative activism. They see it as activism because for many white people, um, the hope uh, for racial justice is by way of good intentions because none of them wants to be seen as racist. Thus, most of what we call performative activism, symbolic efforts, does not center loving Blackness. It centers preserving white innocence. So there's, there's a huge di disconnection there that, that doesn't work. I'm so interested in, in this part of the conversation in, in so many different ways. And as I hear both of you uh, respond to that, um, that, that piece about whiteness and the responsibility of 
uh, white people in loving blackness and and engaging in work that is going to advance, uh, truly advance the work that we're trying to do, rather than simply make themselves look good. Um, one of my good friends and colleagues, Rebecca Deporek, also talks about the idea that that white people need um, their own white accountability groups. That, that they can help each other learn and grow through some of their own internalized white supremacy. And um, that, but at the same time, that that's never enough. Um, she just did a, a really nice um, interview with the Washington Post uh, about this. And, um, you know, it really does require that, um, white people be engaged with the black community and um, the Latinx community and the Asian community and, and you know, go beyond themselves and, and what they've uh, typically learned in their own worlds um, so that they can grow beyond that. Um, I want to, I want to, you know, keep, keep going with this conversation and, and Dr. Zamora Lou, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you and, and ask you a an additional question. You're doing some uh, important work with colleagues on the conceptualization of systemic racism, anti-Blackness, and white supremacy in relation to white space and time, uh, in which you propose some radical changes in how we conduct research and enact pedagogical practices in the academy. So I was wondering if you can describe some of those radical changes in research and pedagogy and talk just a bit about um, who will gain from such radical changes and who might be resistant to them. Thank you, Dr. Worthington, uh, for that question. Um, in our co-authored work, Drs. Liu and Dr. Shin and I uh, conceptualize and explain systemic racism through uh, a racial spatial framework, wherein Blackness uh, anti-blackness, white supremacy, and racial capitalism interlock to create and recreate white space. Okay, so this racial spatial uh, onto epistemology is derived from the knowledge and experiences of black and non-black people of color and how we've learned to, uh, through acculturation, racial trauma, and microaggressions to thrive in white spaces and contend with racism such as time theft in these spaces. So to bring this back to the context of the academy then, and specifically to historically white institutions, higher education predominantly exists in white space and operates in white time. Meaning that in order for us to survive and thrive in it, black and non-black people of color have had to learn certain norms and practices within these spaces and work within white time, much of which have been assumed as normal academic culture right, which is quite ahistorical and evades any interrogation of white supremacy, anti-blackness, and racial capitalism. So, um, but in order for us to thrive in return by complying to these, um, we gain some affiliation with institutional power. Although again, as we've suggested, white colleagues benefit very differently um, and are protected in very differently through white racial privilege and whereas black and non-black uh, colleagues of color receive what uh, we call proxy privileges, those are contingent on how well we behave, how well we exist in that space. So when we're in the academy, and I say we as a whole, but again, with different for different reasons and motivations, um, this creation and recreation of white space happens in our teaching as well as in our uh, research. So as part of our recommendation, we invite our colleagues um, first to examine what we mean by radical changes in research and pedagogy, because the term radical in many ways, like many terms, um, have uh, that were meant to fight anti-blackness and, and, and racism has been diluted. So I say this because when we say radical, it isn't actually that radical for many black and non-black educators of color. These are simply recommended changes toward humanizing black and non-black people of color. The process of change is, isn't thus being radical, it's being humanizing. Um, so when we use radical, 
I think we're framing these changes around white epistemologies and white, the white gaze, right? So we're saying it under the, the current foundations of white supremacy and humanizing black and non-black people of color is not radical under, it's only radical under these current situations. So in research, one of our recommendations is to really rethink about what, I, I talked about positionality earlier in my introduction and really think about who we are in relation to this work. But in, in other words, rethink who gets to be that expert. And are we in the academy, the knowledge makers or are, is it the communities of color from whom we learn? Because we have to reshift who the knowledge makers are. I want to pause here that nothing I'm saying is new. Uh, this has been reiterated through scholarship forever, but it's only radical because again, no one's really listening. Um, we have to think about what counts as rigorous research and thus what uh, counts as scholarship, what is rewarded with tenure and what is not seen as uh, enough. Um, so much of our work with communities of color require time uh, for us to work in meaningful ways rather than just go in and out and extracting knowledge and then benefiting from it. I think we have to think about who we honor in that process, who, who do we uplift. In teaching, uh, I think it means rethinking uh, that our class, rethinking what it means when we say our classroom is a safe space. So whom are we privileging and centering when we're saying that? Because so much of that safe space is to redirect it to the comforts of white students. Even in a space where you're looking at, even if there's just one black or non-black students of color, that has to be changed, right? You can't just think about it as a safe space where students can use it as an emotional experimental lab um, in terms of where they're testing out their anti-blackness, is this anti-black or not? Students must do the work outside of the class before they may enter the class. So those things, fixing your syllabus, is the reading list enough? Um, it's how you embed it throughout rather than just that one unit. Uh, it's how you talk about it. So it, it's all of that. And I'm just gonna stop there. I would love to respond. You know, I love the point about whose knowledge are we valuing, and I think we commit epistemic injustice when not only we exclude community knowledge, but also practitioner knowledge and practitioners of color who often work on the ground to carry out racial equity work in, in ways that are seen and unseen, right? Uh, so a couple of years ago, I had funding from the Spencer Foundation to host a convening that allowed us to reimagine how we do research on racial equity uh, in ways that are grounded in the sort of practitioner realities of those who work on the ground. And what we did was we flipped the script and we positioned practitioners as knowers and as discussants of research briefs that scholars wrote around racial equity research topics and gave them feedback about their research agendas and the questions that they ask. Oftentimes researchers, we ask questions that we think are important, right? That have theoretical or methodological significance, but it's not always uh, congruent with the realities of those who are uh, charged with carrying out that work and their positional powers and authority uh, to be able to advance it in any meaningful way. So, you know, I'm very much so a fan of participatory community-based uh, research designs that position community and practitioners as equal contributors and knowers in the research design process. So, you know, th that's one way at least that I've been thinking about how do we, I don't know if it's radical enough, but it, it's certainly how, we, how do we rethink uh, how do we do work in ways that are more responsive um, to the needs uh, of practitioners who are working on the ground to carry out racial equity work. Yeah, absolutely. This is great. This is awesome. So as both both of you were, were talking, I, I, I kind of struggled to myself. I thought about, I was asked by um, another institution to come in and create um, a series of um, workshops and talks to um, kind of like a DEI. And I cringe when I say that, but kind of like a DEI 
esque type thing, right, for faculty and staff um, for that university. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, throwing out names of, you know, certain keynote speakers who we could invite. And um, everyone who I suggested, no, 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 no. And then someone said, what about this person? What about this? And I said, hey, because this is a small, you know, school in the Midwest. I'm like, well, how much money do you all think, you know, do you have? These people cost a lot of money. And they said, well, no, we have to get someone on this level for our faculty to listen to them, right? We're not talking about research, right? We're just talking about the lived Black experience. Having a fellow faculty member come in as a keynote speaker and discuss the lived Black experience and why faculty at that specific institution needed to know about it, need to be familiar with it, um, and needed to understand some of the issues that are facing their Black students or Black colleagues, so on and so forth, right? I said, so wait a minute. So we need someone from our one university who is renowned, who's making 200, you know, a thousand, right? That's who we need to speak to the Black, to, to convince your faculty of the Black experience. No, we don't need that. We can get a janitor, we can get, right? We don't need that. Right, And so as you all were talking, that experience came to mind of who is the creator of knowledge. So again, we're not even talking about research, right? The only qualification really that this person needed was to have lived the black experience, but yet, right? Working through the lens of white supremacy, working through whiteness, right? Centering whiteness, all these other criterion were, were, were created around who would be suitable to speak about the Black experience? And it had to be someone from a prestigious university, so on. And so it blew, it absolutely blew my mind, right? And, and so, you know, as we're talking through these, these questions and these concepts, I'm just further reminded just how deeply rooted white supremacy is in academia. You know, just to be reminded of that experience. Um, and so, yes. So I love the question of who, who's creating knowledge and who's even qualified to be heard to express their own lived experience. Who's worthy of being heard, right? Yeah. It's beautiful. I, I, um, I just have to pause there to let that, sort of sink in a bit and to absorb that. Um, those are very powerful words. And, and I, 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 um, I wanna hear you continue to talk a little bit about that. I know that you know, you're, you're interested in uh, examining how mediated images uh, of the black community perpetuate systemic racism and anti-black racism. And I wanna hear you say some more about that. Um, you know, we've, we're in this time of, you know, um, activism where we're trying to build allies and get people on board with doing this work. And yet a lot of our white allies don't know how to do it. Um, and they don't realize the impact that they're having on the people that they think that they might be trying to be engaged with and to be supportive of a movement with. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Talk about the impact that that misunderstanding has and, and, and where do we go with that? Right, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, when we're talking about mediated images, whether it be through television, film, you know, there's already been extensive research conducted on uh, the various uh, negative tropes of um, the Black community, whether it be the mammy, the Jezebel, the angry, aggressive, hyper-masculine, overly sex Black man, right? So, so we already have quite a bit of existing literature on those topics, although those images are still very much present, right? Even more so now, and even more so now with um, the presence of social media which is so pervasive, right? And so now we see social media now being used um, as an added agent, not only to further perpetuate um, anti-Black negative tropes, but to 
perpetuate white supremacy and performative activism. I remember shortly after uh, the murder of George Floyd on Instagram, everyone put a, I think it was a black square as their picture, right? Everyone put a black square. And I'm gonna be honest, I did at first. And then I thought about it, I'm like, why did I do that? And I heard, I, I deleted it and be like, why did I do that? I don't need to do that, right? Um, and so my colleagues said, oh, you know, did you put up your black square? Did you put up your black square? And that's actually when I, I deleted it because I realized, and so my colleagues, my, again, well-intentioned folks, that that was, you know, that was what they needed to do. But what ends up happening is activism towards various, um, social justice issues then becomes trendy. It becomes trendy to do. It becomes trendy to jump on board with, right? So not only is there this kind of, um, uh, you know, as Rosina said, kind of comforting white guilt, right? Comforting white fragility, um, but also being trendy, right? And, and doing what everyone else is doing. Um, and, but again, it detracts, it distracts from the real work. Again, it, it's dangerous. I say that understanding that there are some folks who want to be allies. They just don't know how, right? And so what ends up happening is with social media and folks taking selfies at Black Lives Matter protests and there is a false narrative that's created that this is all you have to do in order to be an ally. This is what it looks like to be an ally. And so they go out, they do it, and I'm an ally and I've done something, right? And so again, there's this, this recursive cycle of this illusion of movement when no movement has been made. Also, and the last point I'll make is it directly and indirectly, we're talking about again dehumanization of the of blacks, it reduces the black experience in the black community to our trauma, to our pain, and to our suffering. And so, no longer are we talking about um, anti-blackness. Now, the goal is to be seen at a protest. Now that's the focus, but we're not talking. And so it goes back to, again, what was said, you know, are we centering, loving and celebrating blackness or are we centering, comforting or insulating white guilt? And that ultimately is what performative activism does, especially with the advent of social media and taking selfies and doing this and doing that. It just further centers whiteness and distracts from really doing the real work that's needed and then celebrating blackness and learning about our community, our culture, our history. Dr. Johnson, Dr. Zamora Lou, do you have a- Dr. If I had to add anything to the conversation, it was already <laughs> so well said already, uh, is that I think lots of uh, activists, uh, allies rather, are interested in sort of checklist type uh, things to sort of absolve themselves from their white guilt um, and innocence. I think there's a cultural humility that is necessary for being a, an ally, an activist, and to, to see this as not a static state of being where we sort of arrive at these level of competencies, but be willingness, uh, a willingness to engage in the sort of lifelong learning uh, and critical self-reflection and having the sort of humility to say, when I made a mistake and when I messed up uh, and invest in the sort of um, redress that's needed to, to repair harm. Uh, so I, I would just offer, you know, for those who are thinking about their role, especially white allies, I think the cultural humility uh, is a useful stance for positioning oneself uh, in, in relation to this work. Uh, you know, I, I'm I, again. You know, this is this is a really powerful conversation, and and one that is you know um, really difficult in so many ways because there's 
it, it's really difficult. And I can see some of the questions coming through already um, that we're gonna take momentarily um, from, from our audience. And, and they're very curious now about, you know, so what is the answer? You know, where do we go with this, right? Are we in this, this really challenging environment where um, people who don't know don't know how to know, right? Are people who, um, you know, really just at the very early stages of this, who, who maybe want to learn more, but don't know how to go about it, that, that they feel like they're in this position where um, if they ask their, uh, their friends and acquaintances who are Black or, or non-Black people of color, um, that that's a mistake, that that's, that's doing something that's invasive and inappropriate in some way, um, asking us to do work that they need to do for themselves. Uh, or if they're asking only their, their, their white friends and colleagues, is, is that enough? Are they, gonna, are they gonna perpetuate white supremacy in, in ways that you know, are problematic? And uh, do, do, do any of you have any answer for, for some of these challenging uh, binds that people are finding themselves in? Um, if I may? Um, offer, and it, it's 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 not going to be. Uh, there's no toolkits for any of this. Um, I think it's important first uh, for each of us, and especially our white colleagues, to examine what has allowed them to not know up until this point, what their motivations are, um, and then to live that theory of uh, being an anti-racist. So what I mean by living it is. It begins, yes, everybody loves book clubs and they started with the book clubs. Book clubs, except that book clubs only exist within the book club confines, conversation. That has to be lived, right? In, in, in how you live your life, who you engage with outside of the community. When we're thinking about uh, teachers, for example, I mean, teacher education, um, so much of what we discuss is within the class and then teachers leave the community that they teach in um, there's a disconnection there. So you don't really learn from that space. So uh, it takes a really, a, re, a true re-examination and flipping um, uh, what the foundation of it. So I know that we all always talk about, um, well, if I don't want to be a racist and, you know, if we fight racism, then we have to be anti-racist and be anti, you know, fight uh, the fight as in anti-racist, except that I think it's important for us to also understand that um, as um, Franz Fanon taught us, that colonialism and decolonialism can't exist on the same spectrum in the same way that racism and anti-racism is not on the same spectrum. Because to do one thing requires the annihilation of the native subject, right? So it has to start from scratch. We have to start from the bot, uh, the, the a clean slate. I think what we're doing right now is we're doing cosmetic changes and we keep building on a house of cards that was not meant to support uh, black humanity, to uplift um, black people and black communities and by association in various ways as we've indicated non-black people of color. The point about cosmetic changes, uh, I have a colleague who has been writing about cosmetic diversity and how institutions sort of manipulate uh, numbers on their websites to appear more uh, diverse uh, without sort of fundamentally changing and altering, you know, the way our institutions function uh, and, and who benefits from our policies and practices. So, you know, I think so, so much of the work in higher education still rooted in the diversity and inclusion paradigm. And so if we're talking about addressing anti-Blackness, if we're talking about addressing systemic racism, you know, diversity and inclusion are an outcome of equity and justice. We get diversity and inclusion when we prioritize and focus on equity, but we, what we consistently see are uh, the, the sort of pendulum 
back and forth movement where institutional leaders, uh, and you know, Roger knows more about this than me, when chief, chief diversity officers oftentimes are put on the spot to sort of respond to and mollify concerns of campus constituents when there is a protest uh, or an, an issue. And then we have these superficial cosmetic uh, uh, dressings of the university, whether it's the task force, whether it's the commissioned report, whether it's a report to do a, a, a committee to commission another report uh, without thinking uh, about who our policies and practices benefit and who are excluded. You know, one interesting, uh, you know, movement now is the defund the police movement, right? So if we recognize that uh, campus policing is part of a larger carceral apparatus that uh, primarily seeks to regulate, control, uh, dehumanize, and enclose the sort of emancipatory visions for Black, Brown, uh, trans, and other minoritized people. How do we rationalize under the guise of safety and security the, maintain the, the maintenance of a structure that also penalizes and disproportionately you know, impacts a, a targeted community and group? Those are the kinds of questions I think we have to grapple with as it relates to our policies, practices, who do they serve, who do they purport to serve, uh, but also who they harm, and broadening the aperture of how we define harm, how we define safety on our campuses. It's not that students are always physically assaulted, it's that emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, you know, they are harmed from, you know, race-based anti-Black uh, experiences on our campuses. And oftentimes we use very narrow definitions of harm and safety. So I, I saw some of the questions popping up in the Q&A and then thinking about how do we uh, sort of, um, what are some practical things? I think we, we began to audit and take stock of our policies and practices and who benefits from them. We, we seek stories, anecdotal, and you know, collect data on how students are experiencing various aspects of our campuses. Uh, and we don't need a campus climate survey to do that <laughs> all the time. You know, we, we know a story of a student who's been impacted by you know, a particular experience on campus and that ought to compel us to, to do something about it, uh, even if it's one. Really appreciate you talking about um, both DEI as a, as a potential sort of like um, unpleasant activity at this point, right? And, and, and then also talking about the role of cabinet level diversity officers in trying to transform our institutions and the bind that they often find themselves in. Really um, individuals who are motivated by um, anti-racist, philosophy and yet in a position that doesn't really truly allow them to engage in anti-racism in their work, right? And then does that make them complicit when they are engaged in the sort of more traditional DEI kinds of activities, the kinds of things that in the quote that I offered from Ben Reese, you know, are, you know, helping people feel included, right? And helping people um, know that um, they, they're being supported when they're in pain and, and those kinds of more superficial things rather than the foundational transformational effort that really, and that's what people are starting to ask in the, in, in the chat, right? In the, in the Q and A, um, how do we do this transformational work? what is going to be transformational, um, you know, and, and without being too prescriptive, right? Um, how, do we, how do we do that work in ways that are really going to change our institutions rather than be performative? Do you have any sort of suggestion for what people are struggling with here? I mean, I think, you know, you can think about it on that administrative level, you can think about it on, around faculty and staff. You can think about it from a grassroots level, encouraging students to take ownership and, and to engage in the governance of their institutions. Where, where do we start with this? Well, I think that you can start anywhere, any of the areas that you just, that you just listed. Uh, one way in particular that a person, one person can start 
is, is number one, really doing a deep dive into their own um, implicit and explicit biases, right? And this does not just only apply to um, white folks. This is people of color as well, right? So to do a, a true self inventory of our own biases and the ways in which our own biases might show up, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be in our research, whether it be in our interactions with our colleagues or outside of um, the college campus. The next thing would be to kind of, you know, as my grandmother would say, identify your ministry, right? Where, where is your passion? Where is your passion line? Where are some areas where, in which you're strong in? So, you know, if you um, enjoy working with students, then, you know, maybe perhaps create an affinity group for a specific marginalized student group for them to talk about various issues on campus, right? If you're, ish, if you're strong in research or grant writing, then thinking about, right? And so, identifying, you know, where's your passion, where are your strengths, and, and how can you build around your passions and your strengths um, and integrate uh, the university within that to build out efforts, right, to um, actually make small um, active steps uh, towards kind of this transformational process. The second piece would be, um, organizing with others who share the same passion and interests. Um, you know, uh, reaching out to um, your university president with ideas for, so for example, at LMU where I, um, where I have a, a full-time position, I, um, I participated in a workshop to uh, help faculty work on decolonizing their syllabi. And that turned into um, our university president coming to our group and asking us to work on creating um, an anti-racism uh, research center on campus. Um, what does not currently exist, right? And so a smaller, but much needed, trust me, much needed <laughs> um, opportunity workshop has now blossomed and developed into something much larger um, to which I hope will have a much more even significant impact on our campus culture, right? But it started with me identifying, okay, where's my passion? Where are my interests? How can I build around those passions and interests and the time and the energy that I'm willing to exert toward this? And something else kind of came about as a result of that. So I think it all starts in, you know, I come from a counsel therapist perspective. So I always say it starts within us, right? We can't go and, you know, wave our finger and wag our finger and say, you bad racist, when we haven't done the work to check with our own biases, right? And check how we're operating and how we're showing up, right? And so I, my answer is always going to be, it starts with us. Excellent, and I and I want to keep keep moving along here. I'm conscious of time. We only have a few more minutes, really, to incorporate some of the questions that we're getting from the audience. And and there's one here that kind of hits home for me uh, in a lot of ways because um, there there the the question really has to do with and I'm going to paraphrase here. So um, the the person who's asking the question, I apologize if this doesn't exactly hit what you were looking for. But you know, I I've worked in in uh, states in institutions where there is a conservative leaning legislature. And, you know, we all know that our public institutions get their funding or part of their funding from the legislature, from the state. And so they're, they're expressing fearfulness of uh, upsetting the legislature. And I know you know, of colleagues who have had real serious problems of, you know, um, having their offices or even their own position defunded by the legislature, right? Um, uh, you know, I've, I've served as a cabinet level diversity officer in two different institutions and in both of those situations encountered situations where people were concerned about what would happen if we go too far for the right-leaning individuals who are out there right now doing this anti-critical race theory, you know, 
initiative that they think you know they're gonna you know create more just for the culture wars and so how do we deal with that how do we how do we um, promote transformational change and really also care for our colleagues who are in these institutions where the threats are you know that you know you're gonna you're not gonna get tenure that's a really hard question <laughs> And, and it's such a real, I, I've witnessed it as well. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I think one of the things that um, it certainly boils down to is uh, leadership, right? Who the leaders are and what they're willing to do and to protect um, faculty, for example, from doing this work. We need institutional sponsorship. And that's why sometimes when we're thinking about um, liberation and we're saying, but we, we don't need white power institution. As long as we're inside of an HWI, that connection, that proximity is, is so important. And yet there's a price to it as Dr. Hoskin er, earlier said too, is when we're complicit. When we are complicit, we're always trading off what are the gains and what are the losses. Um, and many of us have benefited uh, from our complicity. So um, I think a lot about Dr. Derek Bell, um, who lost his job uh, until, and, and he, he, he's, he's the founding um, scholar of critical race theory, and he lost his job because he lived it. And I think um, that's a real thing. And I think that still exists when we're thinking about um, many scholars who have not gotten tenured because of the things that they say, calling the uh, calling out uh, white supremacy and anti-blackness as it exists. One of the things we see in even our efforts, um, it, whether it's on campus or other similar organizations, also is there's always a vote. Um, let's see what the consensus is. There are some things you cannot vote uh, to do. There are some things you have to just do. I've never had a say in uh, perpetuating whiteness. Uh, I had to just do it, right? I didn't get a vote. Um, so, you know, even in efforts, anti-racist efforts, there's still a vote. Let's see what the consensus says. You know what the consensus is? That's the status quo. That's not any change. And we need leaders who are willing to commit to that work. Um, I know that at our college, we're doing a lot of really great things. One of which is courage. Um, our college has a committee that is dedicated to racial justice um, and equity. And um, I'm just gonna do a shout out for Dr. Bridget uh, Turner Kelly, who is a phenomenal leader. And she is doing it from the ground up really doing a real audit of what's happening. Um, in terms of what you've just said, Dr. Worthington, uh, it, 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 in terms of legislature, I have no answer for that other than having more people of color and who are, um, or uh, white allies who are in these positions who understand the importance of, for example, critical race theory and framework. Um, I would just echo uh, those sentiments. You know, I'm in a college where our dean has articulated, and the college has articulated an anti-racist strategic plan. And you know, fairly recently, I had uh, someone who attended a talk that I did uh, and wrote a nasty note <laughs> to me and my dean and uh, department head and uh, about how I was anti-white and uh, you know, and I told my dean, I said, "This is what it means to have an anti-racist college." that when you have anti-racist faculty who go out here and do this work, I need you to have my back when this happens. And she did, and my department head did. And you know, I, we need allies who are courageous uh, in their leadership roles and who are willing to, and I tell them, I don't wanna deal with this issue. You know, I am, I figure I did my, my job if that was the sort of response that it caused that sort of cognitive dissonance among some participants, uh, but, but it's the reality and risk associated with doing um, work that aims to expose uh, and call out systemic oppressions. But you know, as a non-tenured assistant black professor, 
there are risks associated uh, with that. And so I have to neg uh, you know, negotiate and navigate what that means for my own sort of professional trajectory, but I'm appreciative of being in a college uh, and, and under leadership uh, that understand the necessity of the work that I'm doing and have created the structures in place to be able to protect and enable me to do it at, at, at larger uh, scale. So I, I think that's one way of how we, how leaders began to create systems and structures uh, so that folks are enabled to do this work without uh, the kinds of consequences that we would otherwise be exposed to without. So great. I, I love the points that both of you have made just, just right there. And, and uh, Dr. Zamora Lou, I, I love how you talk about consensus building sometimes is essentially moving into the status quo. And I've been, I've been saying for years that if you're going to do this work, you, you, you don't do consensus building. You, you do momentum building, right? You, you build momentum in the direction that you need to go. And, it, and sooner or later, you know, the institution is moving in that direction and people have to get on board. Uh, and, and I've been in that position, Dr. Johnson, where I, I, was, I was doing this work as an assistant professor at another institution and was challenged uh, pretty seriously uh, by doing the work. And, and I survived it. And, and now as a, as a professor, I, I wanna make sure that I'm helping other people navigate those waters as well. So, so it's important. Um, we have only a few more minutes left, so I'm going to ask one more question, and um, it's um, a tough one because, you know, uh, I, there's so many good questions, and I, and I want to go ahead and get this one in. Can you all define your understanding of anti-Blackness juxtaposed to racism? What are the limitations of higher education in eradicating anti-Blackness, and how does this play a role in how we claim to center Black humanity in our work. If I may start, and then <laughs> um, I think dismantling anti-Blackness is impossible. Um, so that's the impossibility of it. So to define anti-Blackness is the dehumanization of Black people and Black communities. That's the simplest term, but it has had its function it has a very explicit function in the system as it exists right now. And to dismantle anti-Blackness would be to dismantle the system as it exists right now. Systems will not dismantle itself. People benefit way too much from it, from the exploitation of Black people and Black communities and by association, non-Black people of color. That said, that impossibility feels extremely pessimistic. I am a very pessimistic person, if it's not already apparent. I don't have an answer for that other than to say that these are very intentional and explicit, have, has anti-Blackness is very intentional and it's, it has existed before, not just now, Right? It has existed since forever because white settler colonials have always benefited from exploitation of Black people. So I would just offer Michael Dumas' work as a useful starting place for thinking about and beginning to understand and grapple with uh, anti-Blackness and especially in education. But if we see uh, institutional structures, policies, practices as sites, uh, not just where racism resides, but where Black suffering is normalized. Black marginalization, uh, sort of Black enclosures are normalized. Uh, it's, it's sort of how I began to think about the distinctions between racism as part of this larger um, sort of structural manifestation that occurs across multiple levels that uh, maintain uh, white supremacy uh, and, and superiority, anti-Blackness uh, sort of being an analytic lens and tool for uncovering the way in which Black suffering specifically uh, is routinized and normalized uh, within institutions and within institutional logics uh, as well. Anything to add, Dr. Hoskins, last chance? You know, I'm, I'm far from a pessimist. Um, I'm a hopeless optimist, but um, I 
would have to agree with uh, Dr. Zamora Lou. Um, I don't think that anti-Blackness will be eradicated um, in, in my lifetime at least. Hopefully I'll be proven otherwise, but I don't think so. But what I am hopeful about is that we can move closer to um, also as Dr. Zamora Lou said, um, humanizing blackness, um, which has never been the case in the history of this country. And that is why I think it feels so impossible because that's never been the case. As what has been said before, this country was founded on the exploitation of marginalized groups, of, by raping and pillaging and, and mass genocides, right? And so um, we've never seen an America um, that did not involve um, exploitation in that way. Um, and so that's part of the reason for my pessimism with regard to that, but I am hopeful that we, through efforts such as these and actually placing action with these discussions, um, that we can at least move closer to um, humanizing Black people and Blackness. Thank you all for your comments. And um, I wanna just bring some close to our conversation today and bring one of my colleagues back to help us um, give thanks to some of the people who have helped us produce this. Um, I, wanna, I wanna end maybe with a little bit of optimism uh, and say that um, it's a great pleasure to work with a panel that is as brilliant as this one and to know that we have scholars out in the world uh, doing this work in real ways that are truly going to have an impact and helping us to guide uh, everybody else out there in higher education and across this country and hopefully across the globe as we do this work uh, for real in the real world and not just performative. And so thank you for your, for your work today and for being a part of this important panel. And I'm gonna invite, I believe Dr. Moore back in to join us and um, help us with giving some thanks to the people who helped us produce this panel. Thank you. This has truly been a wonderful afternoon. Um, and I am just uh, filled with honestly, uh, true appreciation for our panelists and our moderator, thank you. We would like to acknowledge those who have helped to support today's broadcast. Thank you to each of you. Um, Aaron Cullany, Daitu DeSasa, Sama Sabihi, Sun Tran, Kaya McDermott, Amber Pasha, Dr. Brandon Elmore, Elaine Henry, and the archive captioning team. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you to all of our attendees and panelists, again, for participating in our webinar on anti-racism in higher education. We invite you to learn more about the center via our social media platforms and our website. Please continue to remain safe and well. Thank you.